Hello, I'm Bernie Hayes. Today's guest is Gregory Carr. He's an artist, writer, actor, and many other things. Today on The Bernie Hayes Show. Welcome back. My guest is Gregory Carr. Greg, how are you? I'm great, Bernie. How are you? Um, I'm doing wonderful, man. You know, it's hard to pinpoint you as to put a structure to your name. You, you do so many different things. Uh, you're at Harris Stowe State University, right? That is correct. I've been at Harris Stowe State University for about 16 years now. So and what, what do you do there? 16th year. And what department? I work in the Department of Humanities, and I am a communication studies instructor. So I teach everything from public speaking to theater to anything that's dealing with communications. And you're also an author? I am an author and a playwright. Uh, I'm, I'm also an aspiring screenwriter as well, so I, I wear a lot of writing hats. I understand you're a bowler, too. I am a bowler. Yes, I am. <laughs> I, I have one 300 game under my belt, and I'm hoping to get a couple of more. Hey, Greg, you have a new production coming up. Tell us about that. What's happening? Yeah, it's, it's a, Bernie, it's a, it's a new production, but it's an old production. Uh, the name of it is uh, Live from Ferguson. Uh, it commemorates uh, the events that happened from August 9th with the killing of Mike Brown all mm -hmm. the way up into the November uh, verdict or non-verdict uh, with the police officer that, that shot Mike Brown. It's poetry, it's rap, it's monologue, it's spoken word, dance, all of these things and it's going to be performed at the Broadway Bound Theater Festival in New York it's September 11th, 15th, and 16th. Wow, that's very, very, very close. Uh, how, did it get, how did you get it to, do, to perform there? Well, I, I belong to a lot of Facebook groups, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. and there was, there's a particular group called, called, I think, Playwrights Forum, and I noticed that last year, last summer, really at the height of the George Floyd protests, uh, this particular organization, Broadway Bound Theater Festival, decided it, it needed to do something because it felt guilty that it had not reached out to writers of color. So they decided to extend a call for their festival exclusively for black playwrights. And so I submitted two of my works. And then when I got the email, I saw one that said, uh, thanks, but we won't be choosing this play. And I saw the second email said, congratulations, we, we're selecting this one. That was the live from Ferguson. So... It's been very exciting. It's been eye-opening. I actually went to New York in the end of May to see the theater. I had a chance to walk down Broadway and walk down 42nd Street. So, so for somebody who's in the theater, that was a huge thrill just to walk down those streets that all those theater greats walk down. Yeah, that, that's the that's the big big walk there in that broad yes. boardwalk, the Broadwalk, the Broadway Walk. Uh, Greg, how did you? Uh, come up with this particular idea about Ferguson and Mike Brown? Well, Bernie, I came up with this particular production mainly because I'm an activist at heart. I have to mm -hmm. say that I'm an activist. I've always been an activist. Even when I didn't realize I was an activist, yeah. when, when I had some situations in high school, I, I think I had a high school coach. I, was, I think I was a wrestling manager. And he did something I thought was very unfair. So I boycotted. I said, I no longer want to be the manager. I said, I'll wait till next year. So that's something that's kind of part of my, my, uh, my DNA. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of protests as a graduate student. And I'm dating myself. When I was in graduate school, Bernie, uh, Nelson Mandela was still in jail. And we were trying to dismantle apartheid. Yeah. And so we did a lot of protests. So, but then I realized once Ferguson came, I wasn't the same youthful high school or college student. And what was happening on West Florissant was very, very different. And fortunately, I had some friends of mine who connected me with a radio interview. I think it was the International Business Times. So I started doing radio interviews and Internet interviews as my form of activism. But I felt like I needed to do something else. I said I needed to do something artistic. So I just started writing down some thoughts. I said, because I think one night I was out with the protesters mm -hmm. and that was the last night I was out there because I couldn't run as fast as those young people. And so I decided to write a, a piece from their point of view, because nobody has spoken for the community and those who are out protesting, and that's pretty much what Live from Ferguson is from the protesters and the community's point of view. Oh, this is wonderful. You know, you don't ever pat yourself on the back, but you made some changes also at SIUE, didn't you not? I did. <laughs> uh, I, I had an opportunity to work at SIUE 
almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I was uh, an adjunct professor. I was nearly one of the pro assistant professors. I really would have liked to have been there, but I guess, you know, fate said otherwise. But yeah, I had a chance to participate uh, with the uh, Black Theater Workshop. And so uh, I was good friends with Lisa Colbert, who was a, a professor at that time. Mm -hmm. And she was a good friend of mine, good friend of the family. And just that year, I said, I said, Lisa, I heard you're doing Raising in the Sun. I said, I know you keep inviting me down to SIU Edwardsville. I said, but this year I'm coming. She said, I'm going to hold you to it. And then unfortunately, in May of 2002, Lisa passed away. And a couple of her students and I were in the same show at the Black Rap. I think we were doing Bubbling Brown Sugar, and they were just totally upset. And I said, I asked, and Joel King, Joel P.E. King, another you know, excellent actor and director right. and producer. And I said, Joel, is there anything I can do for you? He said, well, unless you got an MFA in theater, you can't do anything like that. I said, yes, I do. He, was, he said, don't play with me. I said, yeah. And so he, he made a connection with me, and I connected with a, a good friend now. His name is uh, Bill Grivna and brought me down to SIUE and made quite a few changes. And so now my good friend Kathy Bentley uh, is now running that program down there. It's doing an excellent job. So that's kind of where I got my first real feet wet in higher education and, and teaching at the college level. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And you made a big difference too, Greg. I want people to know that you you really, really did. And uh, you. although you don't pat yourself on the back, I'll pat you on the back. I, I, I accept yeah. it. I receive it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Greg, how did you get into acting and why, how did you choose that profession? I think acting came for me naturally, Bernie, because I'm the youngest of five, five boys, no girls. And so as the youngest in the household, I've always learned, I've studied psychology. My roommate was a, a psychology major, so I used to read a lot of his books. The mm -hmm. youngest tends to have a very active imagination, so I was alone quite a bit because my brothers were much older. And I just like to act. I love to watch TV. I, one of my favorite activities as a youngster this again, I'm dating myself again on Channel Four. I know you remember this, Bernie. Late, late at night, the Bijou Theater. Oh God, yeah. And I used to stay up all night to watch yeah. all the shows <laughs> on the Bijou Theater. I fell in love with Judy Garland and Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. All these people. I said, I want to do that someday. And so I started doing some acting in a high school class. And one of my my theater teachers said, "You're a natural, Greg." He said, "If you go into theater in college, that would be great." So I was actually do, working in a work study at William Jewell College, my first college, and I was painting frescoes for the floor, just the, the, the tiles on the floor. Yeah. And then somebody came to me and said, you know something, the person who is playing the Prince of Verona has to get a uh, root canal, and the person who is playing the Chief Watchman is going to become the Prince of Verona. Greg, we heard you had some acting experience. Do you think you could play the Chief Watchman? I said, sure. I had never been in a production for Bernie, and my very first production, full production I've ever done was Shakespeare. Wow. And I had to learn how to sword fight, I had to learn the language, so I was so terrified. I memorized all my lines that day, and I came to rehearsal completely off book, and, and I came out and did my lines, and, and the director, I remember his name was Kim Harris, he, and he said, stop. I said, did I do something wrong? He goes, no. You have stage presence. I said, is that good? <laughs> you know, I thought someone asked, is this a bad thing? He said, no, you, you have the, the greatest stage presence I've ever seen. So I just kind of have gone from Shakespeare. I think in the second play I did was The Three Sisters by Chekhov. So, mm -hmm. I mean, who, who, who does that? Shakespeare, the first play, and Chekhov, the second play. Mm -hmm. And it's just been a roller coaster ride of, of, of fun and excitement ever since then. You know, young people can be very cruel. Were you ever teased about acting, Greg, instead of playing football or? Or uh, being in sports. Uh, Bernie, I, I'm so glad you said that uh, mm -hmm. because <laughs> it's, it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. My sophomore year, I transferred to Tarkio College, which is where I graduated from. Tarkio College yeah. had an amazing theater program. They had this summer stock theater called the Mule Barn Theater that people came from. It was a national treasure. And so the year that I was transferred to Tarkio, I could not play football. I had to sit out. And so as I sat out, I started studying theater and English, and, and and one of the first things I had to do was take a dance class. And I had a little teacher. Her name was Pat Downey Kuhn. She was about five foot two, ninety eight pounds. She was just a dynamite, just a dynamo of a woman. And so she said, "You have to get tight." I said, "Tights." I said, "Okay, so we're going to be in studio because I know." She says, "Oh no, we're going to be in the gym." And so we were literally in the gym. So the same guys I was supposed to be playing football with, here I am dancing around in tights to uh, the Pointer Sisters' jump. 
And, and they're all, look at that guy, look at that guy, look at that guy. And at first I was really self-conscious, but the more I did it, the, the less I cared about it. And then when I was finally eligible to play football, everybody said, so you're going to play football? I said, no, not with you guys. I said, you guys are terrible. I see made fun of me while I was dancing. I said, I think I'm going to stick with theater. And that's kind of what I did. And, and theater, I think, took me to better, greater places than football. It took me to graduate school. Sure. I, had, I got accepted at UCLA, uh, uh, NYU, and eventually I went to University of Illinois for graduate school, which is what I graduated from, University of Illinois. Illini. Yeah. Go, go Illini. <laughs> My uh, guest is Greg Carr. He's an author. He's a playwright. And he has a wonderful production coming up uh, this fall. We'll be right back with Greg Carr after this. For so many years, Bernie Hayes has been bringing the needs of our community to each and every one of us. I thank God for his program, and it helps many people that otherwise would not understand the needs of the homeless. Homeless people continue to remain out in our parks. There are many homeless people that have no place to go, whether it's by day or by night. Bernie's been bringing that need before you. Now, it's absolutely critical that you respond. We have a new administration, finally, that seems very sensitive to the needs of the homeless. Let's let her, yes, our new mayor, Tashara Jones, know that Bernie Hayes' viewers and supporters are behind her as she takes steps to confront some very vicious forces in downtown St. Louis that are diametrically opposed to even having the homeless down there. They'd shove them all out somewhere, dump them in the river if they could get away with it. They don't really care. But I know that you care, so we got to confront these downtown St. Louis interests that are refusing to allow 1411 Locust to open up. We can get the job done. If you'll pray and become an advocate on behalf of such, contact the mayor's office and let her know that you believe strongly it needs to be open right now. Your prayers and advocacy would definitely make a big difference. Homeless people shouldn't have to try to uh, curl up wherever they can, sit, sleep, stand, wander the streets all night long, and by daytime, where's the downtown shelter that's open during the daytime that homeless people can come into? Even when they can get into pop-up shelters in the wintertime, they're still dumped in the streets during the day. Let's get 1411 Locust to open back up at this time. Let's believe God as we do new architectural plans that they'll be received by this new administration and we can go on and get the necessary funds that we need in order to get that building open back up. We're ready to make the repairs. And I thank God for all of Bernie Hayes' viewers and supporters that have been standing with us all these years. But now it's time we come together. Let me know that you're willing to do that. Call us at 314-421-3020. You can follow us at nlecstl.org. But let's do it, folks. The time has come to do it now. Welcome back. My guest is Greg Carr. Greg is a Hornet from Harris State University in Communication Department. He's a teacher. He's a writer. He's a sports fan. He's a actor. He's almost everything you can not imagine. imagine. Greg, um, you, the new play you're talking about, tell us about those who may join us late. What's the new play and when is it going to be produced? Well, uh, thanks for asking, Bernie. Live for Ferguson, we actually did a workshop production in 2018 at Harris State University, just the students, and it was more, more of a class than anything. We were learning how uh, original production takes place. And my students, Lily and I, worked on this together. It was a very collaborative project. But I had a very interesting experience. I, I got a phone call from our, one of our administrative assistants, and they, they said, uh, Mr. Carr, there's somebody on the line. They, they're asking about the show, and they want to know how they can come see the show. I said, sure, transfer them over. And it was a woman, and she was very angry. And she said, why do you have my son on the front of this cover? Do you know anything about my son? Who gave you permission to, to use this picture? She's going on and on. She must have gone on for about five minutes. She was very angry. And she said, my name is Miss Crawford, and that's my son you have on there. She said, why do you, I just want to know, why do you have his, his picture on the front of your program for your show? I said, because I thought he was a hero. I thought what he did to protect other people. I, I said, he kind of exemplified the spirit of the young people out on West Florissant during the Ferguson uh, uprising. And she, she began to cry. And then I began to cry. I got really emotional. I said, she, she said, you know, he's deceased. I said, I know. She said, and he, he's deceased under mysterious circumstances and his little brothers miss him so much. I said, I know I have a son too. And, and I, I feel very strongly for you as, as a parent. And so she says, I would like to come see the show. She said, how much are the tickets? I said, nothing for you. I said, I said how many? She said, who can I bring? I said, bring as many people as you want to. I said, she said, can I bring 10 people? I said, bring your whole family. I said, I'll have tickets waiting for you. We'll have your name on it. I said, because we're going to have a talk back after the show. And so one of my students, who was very, very close to me as well, 
he resembled her son. He has dreadlocks and he actually wore the Star Spangled shirt. And we wow. did that scene very much in slow motion and we did like a strobe light with it. And so at the talk back, we asked for comments from the audience. She was the first person to stand up. She said, I just want to say that I miss Crawford and that was my son. And then she couldn't complete it and she started to cry. And then uh, Armonte Ambus, my actor, jumped off the stage, ran to her, just embraced her, and everybody started getting emotional. Like, everybody started crying. And then she, oh. he kind of put his arm around her and held her up. She was able to complete her, her, her statement. And then just, it was just an amazing dialogue about it. And so many people said, we are so glad that you did this play because people wanted to talk about it. They needed a forum. And this was the perfect opportunity. Theater gives you a great opportunity to have those sorts of discussions. Now, tell us when the play is going to be aired and where. Oh, yes, uh, the Broadway Bound Theater Festival at the, I think it's the, yeah, 42nd, it's on 42nd Street, Theater Row, Theater Row, uh, September 11th, 15th, and 16th. And I also wanted to say, uh, can we talk about the Annie Malone Project as well? I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Linda, sir. Nance, Lin Linda Nance has been a very regular guest here on the program and yes. you know about her Annie Malone uh, situation. Tell us about Annie Malone and you. I'm very excited about this, Bernie, because this is one of my passions is community projects. As you know, I discussed last time, I'm a PhD student at St. Louis University right. in American Studies. I'll be finished in about two years. I'll be defending my uh, uh, dissertation. I'll tell you about that briefly because I have a really good topic. And uh, one of the projects I had this past semester, this past spring semester, was a class called Photography, Archives, and Theory. And so our final paper had to be on something dealing with photography and a particular figure or an event. And I couldn't think of a better person than Annie Malone. So it just gave me a great excuse to study Annie Malone and do the research on her. And I wrote this really powerful paper on her. And so uh, Linda Nance had this exhibit down at the Eugene Fieldhouse down on Broadway. And I got a chance to use her as a source and chat with her. And then we established a relationship and then she invited me back to their Juneteenth celebration and asked me would I bring one of my students to do a brief talk on the importance of Juneteenth. And at the conclusion of it, she said, well, you know, this is the final day for our viewing here and, and our exhibit is going to need a home. She said, do you think uh, Harris still would be interested? I said, I'll talk to them, see what happens. I'll put you in contact with some people. And sure enough, we got together in July and we talked with our interim president, Dr. Latani Collins-Smith, and she gave me the, the, the green light and asked me to take the lead on it. So we're not only going to have her exhibit at Harris Stowe in 2022, from January 2022 to, to June 2022, we're going to have some symposia in September, October, and November. And, and each of our colleges and schools is going to feature a panel. Uh, College of Arts and Sciences is going to go first. We're going to talk about the historical Annie Malone and, and her contributions to history. And then the School of Business is going to talk about her as an entrepreneur. And then the College of Education is going to talk about her as an educator, you know, being the originator uh, of, of Poro College. So we're just excited about that. And then the culminating activity is we want to create a marker right in front of the Emerson Performance Theater because uh, Linda Nance told us that this was the site of Annie Malone's second business in St. Louis, there at Pine, what used to be Pine and Cardinal. Sure. And so we want to mark it historically. That's unbelievable. You know, there's so much history that we don't know about. Uh, there was a movie about Annie Malone. Did you see that? I did, and I, I wasn't really pleased with it. As a historian, I, I, as a historian and a writer, I, I took a little bit of issue with it because yeah. it did not portray Annie Malone in a very positive light. In fact, it, it fictionalized her, called her Addie Monroe. Yeah. I think we're talking about self-made. And the research that I did on Annie Malone, she was the exact opposite of how she was portrayed in the movie. She was a very humble woman, very quiet woman, very strong woman. And the, the one encounter that I learned that Annie Malone had with Madam C.J. Walker, Madam C.J. Walker was giving a big talk uh, of hair care specialist, and Annie Malone was in the audience, and she actually saw Annie Malone, and she never acknowledged her as her mentor. And instead of Annie Malone getting up and making a big to-do, Annie Malone very quietly picked up her purse and walked out and never said a word about it. Uh, and that's, that's who Annie Malone was, just a very humble person. And I think she's definitely worthy of honor. And, and if we have our druthers, we want to try to get a statue of her on the campus as well.
Uh, That's wonderful. Near the uh, Emerson Theater on campus of yes, Harris State, State University? Yes, sir. That'd be wonderful. You know, no, I have not heard any good reviews on that movie that you just described. I've never had anyone say anything good about that particular movie. First off, it was fictionalized and had nothing to do with real history uh, of Annie Malone or Miss Turnbull. You know, um, Greg, you, you, you do so much. How do you find time to do, do your writing? I, I learned a thing from Stephen King. I, I've, always, I've been a Stephen King fan, Bernie, probably over 35 years. And I read, I actually read Pet Cemetery as an undergraduate student mm -hmm. uh, during, a, a, I think it was a summer session I had. I think, I, yeah, I had my internship during the summer in Tarkio. And everybody said, you ought to read Pet Cemetery. It will scare you. I said, I'm not easily scared. I, I watch horror movies all the time. And so I read Pet Cemetery. Uh, in, in, a, in a, a dorm that nobody was in except me, maybe three people. And Bernie, I have an active imagination, as I told you before. <laughs> and I started, I started dreaming that I was in this, yeah. this story. So make a long story short, Stephen King has a very disciplined uh, method. He gets up early in the morning and writes for a couple of hours, maybe at 4 o'clock to maybe 6 o'clock, and he cuts it off, but he does it consistently. So, I, right. so I've always gotten up early to write. And, and really, I, as, a, as a student, I actually did a research on you're a better writer, and I'm, people may not agree with it, but you can actually get better writing early in the morning sure. because your brain has been refreshed because at night, literally, when they say you're brain dead, you, you actually are. You okay. actually have brain cells die, uh, which is why you get you know, slap happy when you're sleeping because your brain is you operating. Up in the morning. But when you wake up in the morning, your brain mm -hmm. has been freshly oxygenated and your, your thinking is a lot clearer. So okay. I try to get up early in the morning and write for a few hours, and then I cut it off and I go on to the next thing. Greg Carr is my guest. So many interesting things to talk about with Greg, but we'll be right back after this. There are so many women and children experiencing homelessness in the United States and throughout the world. You can be a part of the difference today by partnering alongside New Life Evangelistic Center and the work that they're doing to save women and children's lives who are experiencing homelessness. In St. Louis, we have safe houses where women are able to find the rest that they need and the job training and uh, transitioning from going from homelessness to housed. You can make a difference by partnering with us financially today. Another way you can help is the women and children in India who are experiencing brokenness and hurt and pain. Donate to New Life today to make an, a, a huge difference in their lives. There are so many people who are hurting, but you can make a difference in the life of the individual today by partnering alongside New Life Evangelistic Center. Our black history subject for today is Mel Whitfield, who was born October 11, 1924 at Bay City, Texas. During the World War II, he was a member of the celebrated and racially segregated Tuskegee Airmen part of the Army Air Forces. He ran for Ohio State University and for Los Angeles State College. He was a world record holder for the 80-yard race in 1950 to 54, for the 1,000 meter race in 1953, and as a member of the U.S. team for the 4x440 relay race in 1952 to 56, and 4x800-yard relay race in 1952. In the 1958 Olympic Games in London and the 1952 Games in Helsinki, he won the gold medals in the 800-meter races, and in 1948, he won a gold medal as a team member of the 4x400-meter relay race. In the 1952 Games, he won silver medal in the same event. In 1954, he became the first African-American to receive the coveted Sullivan Award as the nation's outstanding amateur athlete. Mel Whitfield. The Bernie Hayes Program is uh, produced at NLEC TV uh, right here at 2428 Woodson Road in Overland, Missouri. It's our new headquarters since they closed the 1411 Locust building. We're working to get back into that building. In addition to that, trying to help so many people through a wide variety of safe houses, training programs, transportation assistance, so many ways people are getting help because of all of you that are supporting the work of New Life Evangelistic Center. Now, if you'll send a gift of $25 or more, we want to send you this special, the Bernie Hayes Show Cup. So when you send your gift, request a cup. We'll be happy to get it off to you. It's New Life Evangelistic Center, P.O. Box 473, St. Louis, Missouri, that's 63166. You can give online at nlecstl.org. Now I'm really asking all of you to join us in praying. The needs are so phenomenal at this particular time. So many hurting and homeless people are contacting us daily, but we're able to help them because of each one of you that are praying, caring, and sharing at this time. Welcome back. My guest is Greg Clark. 
from Harris Stowe State University. He's but one of the places he, he represents. But Greg, uh, tell us about some of the future projects you're, you're coming your way that you're well, working on. Well, Bernie, some of the future projects, as I've discussed, the, the, the thing that I'm most excited about is the Annie Malone project that we're working mm -hmm. on. And Linda Nance and I are going to be working on a, a short play on her experiences. I think the address is 31, 3100 Pine Avenue, where's that business, where it's in front of the Emerson Theater. So Linda yeah. Nance is going to be writing a, a brief one-act play, and I'm going to direct it and kind of assist her with it, with the research, and our students are going to be performers in it. And I think it will give us an opportunity to dispel some of the myths that were propagated by the Netflix movie Self Made. And, and we're just excited about that. I mean, that, that is, to me, that's the most exciting thing I, I've encountered in a while. And again, we have some other projects uh, that we're working on. I'm also working on a novel. As you said, I'm an author and I'm hoping to have this novel completed. Uh, some friends of mine, I belong to an organization called Black Men Speak Up uh, that's headed by my good friend and mentor, uh, Tony Neal. And we took a trip to the Equal Justice Institute uh, memorial, uh, the lynching memorial, back in 2018. Yeah. And we saw this, and mm. uh, he asked me to prepare ourselves for it. And he asked me, he said, would you help us you know, through this? Because you know, we might need prayer, we might need support. And I agreed with him. And we saw this, Bernie, and it was the most powerful thing I'd ever seen. And I had heard for many years, my, I, I claim Henderson, Kentucky is one of my hometowns, which sure. is the hometown of my uh, father and mother, which I'm going to be headed to very shortly. And they told me about several people who had been lynched. And so our task was to see if we could find the names of people that we knew of or heard of. And the first person who was, whose great grandfather was from Elaine, Arkansas, saw his grandfather's name and he just broke down. He just that broke down. We all, we all started having it. And so I started walking yeah. around. And the way it's fashioned is that these uh, beams are way, uh, starts at the eye level and it goes very, very high. And then I saw my, uh, and they weren't my relatives, but people that my parents knew. I saw their names. Mm. And so it set me to thinking, I said, I should write a book. So I'm writing a novel called Passage, which is wow. going to deal with uh, lynching. That's great. I know that's a very powerful ex ex exhibition. Exhibit, rather. Yes, sir. Uh, Greg, how can we reach you and get more information? You can reach me at carg at hssu.edu. That's my personal email. And our website is www.hssu.edu. And my phone number is 314-340-3667. Please call me, contact me. Love to interact with you. Do you cast only from your student population, or do you have open casting? Primarily, we cast for our students, but we have done summer uh, productions in which we've actually uh, cast people from the outside. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, we will bring a guest artist in, uh, so, that, so that is possible. And I also work with St. Louis Community College, and sometimes I'll do productions at, at Forest Park as well. So there are other opportunities. And, uh, and our, our goal is one, one of my colleagues who's going to be working as a producer with us for Live from Ferguson, once we finish the production in New York, we're actually going to bring it back to St. Louis and we're going to, we're going to do a production maybe next summer at the Link Theater in the Central West End. Wow. Yes. So the many years I've known you, Greg, you're always doing something. I mean, it yes, seems sir. like never, every two or three months, Greg Carr is doing something. I just want to say thank you, Greg. Thank I, you, I know Greg. the pandemic has uh, affected all of us. So I just want to say thank you for taking time to come visit with us, and good luck. Once again, how can we reach you? Uh, you can reach me at 314-340-3667. My email address is carg at hssu.edu. But if you want to find out more about activities happening at Harristow, www.hssu.edu. Thank H -S -S you, Greg. H-S-S-U. <laughs> it's good to be a Hornet, right? <laughs> good to be a Hornet. Great day to be a Hornet. Great yeah, day I, to be I, a Hornet. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm Bernie Hayes, and I want to say thank each and every one of you for visiting with us and supporting the New Life Evangelistic Center. Our current address is 2428 Woodson Road in Overland, Missouri, and our zip code is 63114. Reverend Larry Rice has been here doing his thing for more than 50 years. I'm Bernie Hayes. Have a great day, and please stay safe.